Okay, we're looking at a copper mine here. This is part two of the series I'm doing on this. The first one was about an ancient shipwreck that's been found off Anatolia called Iloburan, and it has copper ingots that are on to it. Even in the first part, it's not going into depth about it, although I sneaky let it out. And now I'm uh, showing you this here. This is what an ancient copper mine would look like. This is somebody just going into the part where they have been mining at here and you'll start to see these blue veins and marks that are done here and let's see if I can get that out a little better and you can see just how blue this gets in places like this it's just overwhelmingly beautiful you know in playing my DD campaign there's actually a pole part that works up and it's supposedly with these small people and dwarfs and underwater aquatic creatures and things that are cave bound in a way not necessarily blind like a lot of cave creatures end up being but it's all associated with blue and then there's fungus and mushrooms and things that give off illumination that cause a different look to the area and this definitely gives a different look this is something that you could use in some alien movie as far as some distant land. As long as you weren't a copper person that is actually mining this, you probably have never realized how it actually looks whenever you get into it. Here's a drip down a wall. And in part one, I showed you this glass that had been made out of either cobalt or this. And they showed two different forms of it. This is the form that is being made by copper leaching out into it. And there's little copper stalagmites that you can all see up into there and stuff. And he's about to show some to these other people. But let's go ahead and go to the article and the other part of this and see if we can't get a little bit of understanding here more about it. Now, the person who wrote this article was J. Stuart Wakefield, and he gives his credentials here, and let me say that he knows what he's talking about, and he's a Ph.D., and so on off of it. He's been working in it, and there are two people that did things on this. I believe both of them that we need to say about right now are this person, for he was somebody that totally said, no, that's not possible that what we're not what we're looking at in that copper we find there in that Cypriot copper or whatever has got to be something else other than Michigan copper because Michigan's well known for having an extremely large copper base but also there's a strangeness to it this is like Black Hills gold has its own special signature and somebody that knows what they're doing can test and go yeah that, that's right, that's Black Hills gold. Here's some Yukon type gold. Here's this and that. Other ones is really pretty much the same as normal. But there are some sites that have specialized forms of it. And one special place on earth for copper is Michigan. And it has a float copper that formed up almost like lava. But instead of lava, the whole thing is copper. And erped up. And apparently, the uh, during the last ice age, the glaciers scoured all of the stuff over the top of it. And so it would have left it, well, for a while, as shiny. But then, of course, it would have all turned blue-green-blue blue, like we were just looking at. And that would have drawn a lot of attention to people that would have seen it. And, of course, ancient people that were into mining that we would say in the older days would have to find something that would lead them to believe that they were finding copper or this colored stone here that was special and everybody wanted a lot. Or there really would be no jucks to go out and get it. Just like lapis lazuli was very much sought after. Some people say, well, that was supposed to mimic this. But copper oxide is whenever it's rotting, just like rust is whenever iron and stuff rots. The shipping of Michigan copper across the Atlantic in the Bronze Age, Isle Royal, and Keweenaw Peninsula 
dates to 2400 to 1200 BC, and it seems to end about the time of that ship that we're seeing. That it may have fueled the Copper and Bronze Age itself, and then that collapse that comes out of it could be reciprocal of a few things. We talked about a volcano having taken out and ruined crops for a few years, caused drought and famine type situations, but it could only be multiplied on the fact that all of a sudden a lot of the essentials became rarer let's just say. Recent scientific literature has come to the conclusion that the major source of the copper that swept through the European Bronze Age after 2500 BC is unknown. However, these studies claim that the 10 tons of copper oxide ingots recovered from the late Bronze Age, 1300 BC, Ulaburan shipwreck, talked about, part one, off the coast of Turkey was extraordinarily extraordinarily pure more than 99.5 percent pure copper and I think it has a latent signature that shows a small amount of silver in it too and this is just the same way that you could find a signature that you're not finding anywhere because if this was the same copper as those other people they would all have it too but they don't they have lead in certain ones and other in certain ones so they can kind of pin down at least within a few places where certain ones are and where it all came from. It just makes too much sense. It's too easy. But then there's also that effect where you'd say, um, this one has that signature that none of the other ones have. Well, there is one place that apparently coughed out a bunch of copper back in the day. And we can't attribute it to Indians because anybody that knows anything about them, they only had, you know, Mississippi culture and a few others that apparently come down the Mississippi and through even did this type of thing in metalworking. A lot of people have a skewed view of Amerindians. They didn't have horses until horses got here. It's a little bit different. And in the Wild West movies, they try to Im mimic um, Apache and so on and try to do that. But if you'd run into a Hopi tribe or something else, it would have been looking a little bit different. And you come up to all the way across America and to the Northeast, and they look a lot, lot different. So... 99.5% pure, which can't be gotten anywhere else, and you really can't purify it and get it to the point that there would have been as they see it, even in a modern day. And I believe that's why this guy got into it, for dealing with some copper experts. And he goes, okay, I want you to take some copper and then purify it and do it and then make it exactly like this signature so you can show them it can be done. And they're like, I don't tell you, you can't do that. We can do all kinds of neat crap now, and we, we can't pull that off. What are you talking about? Showed him this copper, and they, oh, yeah, well, in Michigan, you know, <laughs> right there. The oxides are all brittle, known as blister copper, with voids and slag bits and oxides shapes are created whenever the oxides were made in multiple pourings outdoor over wooden fires only Michigan copper is of this purity and is known to have been mined in enormous quantities during the Bronze Age strangely there are a couple of places that they found where they're mining it in these little bitty pits I think they talk about them later but also there was there's a couple of oxide shapes carved in and not just a little rim thing but the whole thing like all you do is pour it in totally and in fact, it would pour out one of the little legs right over here for your excess. Huh. But no, 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 that's, that couldn't be what it is. The geology of copper. Copper is said to be the most common metal on the face of Earth, with the exception of iron. However, most of it is in a form of low-grade ores that require a sequence of concentration mechanisms to upgrade it to an exploitable ore through a series of proto-ores 
copper ores of the oxidized type, including oxidized cuprite and the carbonates malachite, are generally green or blue, as we were looking at, and reducible to copper metal by simple heating with charcoal. So you can fry it like you do limestone and end up getting a bisque out of it that would work. And then refine it into ore. The ore of this reduced type are sulfides or sulfo salts or calcosite, which there's that calco word again, calcoprite and tetrahedrite, which is the shape of the crystal it forms, and are not readily identified in outcrops as actually ores. They require roasting to convert them into oxides and then reduction of the oxides to produce metal. Makes you wonder what oxides and oxides have to do with each other. There are a number of places in the world where copper can be found in small deposits in the pure state, but it is usually embedded in a rock matrix from which it must be freed by intensive labor or today crushed by huge volumes and then treated to obtain the metal. But then whenever you do so, you still get a small signature of all the crap that went on because you can't get rid of all of it necessarily. Early in Earth's history, there were huge volcanic outflows over the Great Lakes area. As new sediments overlaid these flow, copper solutions were crystallizing in the Precambrian flood basalts of the lava layers. The copper had been crystallized in nodules and irregular masses along fracture zones in a few inches to many feet. After a billion years, about a quarter of the age of the Earth, four major glaciations ground upon the edges of the old layered basalt lava beds and exposed some of the embedded copper in these, here in these drawings. And so this is really Lake Superior here, and they're saying Lake Superior is underladen with copper under the whole thing because anywhere it sticks up out of the edges of either side of the lake, contains this copper. So the water that runs through there would be also copper laden too probably, but silts are trying to help keep that leaching effect down. Anyhow, so here we're seeing giant pieces of copper that's on two trees that have been chopped off and then put onto a railroad truss type thing that rolls down the railroad. And this chunk here, and that was just float copper. It was just sitting here on the ground up and it's got this greenish color onto it and they go yep now how the hell are they going to get that there and the problem was just getting it to where they could put it on this railroad thing and take it down to a point they could put it someplace else on something they could carry it home it's a nugget weighing 5720 pounds isle royla and kena peninsula remained high ridges of volcanic basalt the scraping and digging by the glaciers followed by the surface exposure of the hardest material, the metal, was followed by sluicing of the land by glacial meltwaters. This left many mineral nodules of all sizes on the surface in the huge pine forest, and this was called float copper, as it appeared that it had floated up to the surface rather than it being eroded away by the giant floods that came out of the Ice Age whenever it was all melting away, which scoured away and kind of cleaned it up as if you found a nodule right now all with dirt on it and you had a water hose not spraying too hard but you just poured it across it and all of a sudden gleam it's gold or it's copper which would have really looked a funny blue green color but you would have been extremely excited almost as excited as gold nodules of copper were discovered shining on the surf along the shores of Isle Royale they prolonged the prolonged crystallization followed by glacial exposure was a unique sequence of events. When exploited, it took man from the Stone Age to an industrial world. The half billion pounds, half billion pounds mined in prehistory were followed by six and a half billion pounds mined in the Industrial Age in America starting in the late 1800s. People have made the comment that this helped make all the pennies and a lot of the wires and a lot of the everything that used copper during this point in the industrial age. It was a major point of it. Now, whenever they did, how much did they take out? Well, they took out six and a half billion pounds. 
Okay, right. But there was already a half billion pounds mined out in prehistory. Think about that on a scale of how much copper we used during that time and threw up into a modern age and to make all of the things that we talked about and so much more that I can't even think of. So they're showing here this pink band where it runs on this Kiwa Peninsula here and the Kiwa Bay and how it runs under there and these mines have been put in here dotted along the way. Some of these mines go pretty deep too. I saw a deal where they went into one of these mines and they went down and then into this thing and went down and then they're on a level and then they start walking they go, wow, this is way deep, way deep. and they go, this is nothing. They go down a little bit then they get in this elevator deal and they go down to another level and then walk for a hundred yards and then it starts turning all in that blue crap and they've been mining it out going all through there and this is nothing it keeps going on and on and on and then it turns left and follows the vein and does this thing you know so it's pretty neat but just like that video I showed you earlier I didn't show you all of it but they start from the outside and they go all the way through and then down and hit the old ancient vein which isn't even showing anymore and you might see a little blue gleam someplace that's all been taken out long ago and they're running through that but that one was in Cornwall yeah so that that has something to do with like Cornish mines for tin and things that had to do with this most European copper was smelted out of copper ores starting at about 4460 BC yeah, in fact, we've pushed back that date a little bit farther now, but these ores are off, often had a concentration of 15% copper in them, and many had trace element contaminants such as lead. Buried hordes had many trace element contaminants, and buried hordes of bronze are usually composed of broken axe heads, miscellaneous broken pieces and lumps, recycling the valuable metal. Henderson's book, uh, reports a German study that did 12,000 chemical analysis of copper containing artifacts with the aim of identifying where the workshops there were and there were not able to do this but noted that hordes which often contain low impurity metal in southern eastern England and northern France may be linked to the occurrence of copper ingots which also had low impurities so in a lot of these ingots that are made they'd have that but then these things that look like skins now I did a recent video that's about Atlantis of Spain if you got to see it and the actual starting up picture that they got they say that it was like a Scythian or Canaanite type of artistry in gold that is so fine that people have even turned around and said it but they say it's got to be Scythians and stuff due to all this intricate beadwork that's all over it and everything but it conspicuously also is made exactly in the shape of one of these ingots. This ox hide, as it's called. Barber says that the ingot or cake fragments are common features found in hordes of the late Bronze Age and often comprise pure unalloyed copper. Barber also says one mining site in the British Isles, the Great Orm, shows evidence of activity in the early Bronze Age. Burgess says that the British Isles uh, Bronze Age, the remarkable thing is that metallurgy seems to have started in the southeast, apparently as any, uh, early as anywhere in Britain, although the southeast has no local ores. So there are people there doing it, that aren't associated with a mine in any way. So here's a satellite photo of the north end of the island royal in, in Lake Superior and they show you all of these sites hooked up to it and they're giving an idea of how the copper streams run through this. The softer rocks scoured by the repeated glaciation lakes now valleys and harbor. Here's this guy that's standing here Alex Fogati he shows me the remains of 3,000 year old miner pits in the woods behind his rock shop in Kenawa, right there on the peninsula. Starting in the 1840s, mines were going down as far as 9,000 feet in some of these pits.
but you can see that this thing's been dug out and a little run going down through and even logs are in it nowadays and it makes you wonder they're finding big chunks of copper they're doing it out of there are they mining it out well there's been a half a billion pounds mined out of it and uh, I think in this article or the other one I chose not to be the one to use strictly says that you know just one of those little chunks that we saw there that one that was on that railroad tie would make up every artifact that we've ever found in North America. They'd be made out of copper or bronze. And so where did this half a billion tons go to? It's estimated that half a billion pounds of copper were mined in tens of thousands of pits on Isle Royal and the Kiwa Peninsula of Michigan by ancient miners over a period of thousand years. Carbon dating of wood by ancient miners over a period of a thousand years. Timbers in those pits has been dated to mining it starting at about 2450 BC and end abruptly at 1200 BC like so many other things. Officially no one knows where the Michigan copper went all the ancient copper culture tools that have been found could have been manufactured from just one of the large boulders. Yep, this is the one. And a placard in London's British Museum uh, Age Axe exhibit says, From about 2500 BC, the use of copper, formerly limited to parts of southern Europe, suddenly swept through the rest of the continent. No one seems to know where the copper in Europe came from. Indian legends tell of the mining was done by fair-haired marine men, people with boats. Big, big boats, not a canoe. Along with wooden tools and stone hammers, a walrus skin bag has also been found. A huge copper boulder was found in the bottom of a deep pit raised up on solid oak timbers, still preserved in the anaerobic conditions far more than 3,000 years. Some habitation of sites and garden beds have been found and studied in various references. It's thought that most of the miners retired to Aztalan near Madison, Wisconsin, and were other locations to the south that were the onset of hard winters on Lake Superior. So during the winters, they would go down the Mississippi, and that had to do and connected with the Mississippi cultures, and they would refine it down there because these are the two hotbeds where they find it at all. <clears throat> the miners, mining, though, appears to have ended overnight as they had left for the day and never came back. Yeah, there, a couple of the pits that they showed there, it looks like they were ready to even do a whole bunch more, but maybe hit their point where there's 20,000 pounds and we can't carry any more in the boat, and they just left it like we might, we'll come back. Or whatever I guess we'll just drop it here and go or something happened but they never came back here's a petroglyph of one of their sailing ships is found and so you look at this and you go yeah and that's got that snake-headed thing on the left and that Phoenician big sail that's on it there and that looks like it's planked and done out yeah one would have to agree with that Huh. That's strange, huh? Here's another picture, and what's strange about this to some people is, well, they chipped out a perfect hand, and there's his hand next to it to show, but that's a pretty big man, and that hand has longer fingers and is a lot bigger than them. Could have been somebody at least six foot five, could have been even bigger than that, or they could have just chipped it out a whole lot bigger than a hand actually was. But one would think what they would do was take it and put it in red ochre and slap it up there and then chip that all out. And that would basically leave what it is here. But I almost see, think that I can see red ochre still in that handprint today. Like they put it in there deep after that. Here's another picture here which is strange. It kind of doesn't show up well on here. But this is one of those swirl circles with a gap that's shown in it. And the reason they're showing these little light dots over is because the light cuts off of certain little points through there and it goes across it during the winter solstice. 
this line of little dots make it right across there. There are others at points that come through here and make it through. But whenever it does the Christmas saltus, it cuts across there. There's another one very similar to this, and it does a slit from north to south or top to bottom that's in it that only shows up about this time. This picture here you can't see quite as well, so over here it's kind of drawn in. And so what we have here is a bird, right? And then above it is that ancient cross symbol that we've talked about so much, which connects to so many symbologies. The Egyptians used it to mint home or land. But what's weird about that is this isn't a hawk, but what he's standing on is three pyramids. One, two, three. You can even make them out over here. One, two, three. Pyramids. Isn't that strange? And there's a bear that's been carved out here, and they say the reason it's lighter in it is was it had white sand smeared into it. Here's another petroglyph here that gets exposed, and they say that it was a for a sun god symbol. It was been seen in the this circle, by the way, that's right up here, has actually been seen on oxide ingots that are over from the Middle East, the Mediterranean. Note also the deeply carved eye and the bear, the white sand within it, and the greenish colored Bronze Age maize petroglyph, one of the pair behind, left behind an old mill in Rock Valley in the tin mine cliffs between Tintagel and Bogcastle in Cornwall, England, is drawn with single lines, just like the ship petroglyph and the bear. So what they're telling you is that well, here's this, and here's this, and here's that. And here's the same thing over in Cornwall, associated with those mines that we talked about, and the tin mines that go along with copper to make bronze. During this thousand-year period of mining, some of the miners must have explored the continent to the west, as evidenced by the strangely large skeletons in a lot of places such as the red-haired giants who came by boat to Lovelock Cave and Lake Lanshan, Nevada, that were found in 1924 with fishnets and duck decoys. One wonders if they're using arrows and crap that how good, you know, duck decoy. So they're going to sit and hide in reed stands and camo themselves, and they're so good at arrows, bows and arrows, not a shotgun. <laughs> but, but it'd be like hunting them with a twenty two. Or no, this is a bow and arrow, but using duck decoys. There's biological tracer evidence for foot traffic back and forth across the continent. More that 3,000 years before the of Lewis and Clark expedition. Well, if you look in the Lewis Clark thing, then she kind of knew where the hell she was going. But if you look into the tale of her too, she was something else. Yeah, she was a little bit different. They have a few things that uh, aren't usually mentioned in her biography. They know about her. Let's just put it that way. Huber describes the remarkable presence of the Shrub Devil's Club on Blake Point, the northern tip of Isle Royale on a passage island offshore, and also small islands around the Rocky Harbor on Isle Royale. Its usual habitat is the rainforest gullies of the conifer forest of the Pacific Northwest. Humor claims it appears nowhere else east of the Rocky Mountains, but it's there. This plant has giant leaves with spines underneath and frightfully spiny wood stems. It has a history of traditional use as medicines and to treat diabetes, tumors, and tuberculosis. With its effectiveness confirmed by modern studies, it appears likely it was carried like Johnny Appleseed in a medicine bag to this remote island in Lake Superior, like those bags of the Sumerians and so many others in ancient times and the places where the Devil's Club are found, showing us where the miners were using medicines. So it's something that you find on the other side of the Rockies that has been taken and transplanted over here, and it seems to be associated with this same site and these same people. But there's silver in the copper. Pieces of the native Michigan copper sometimes have crystals of silver inclusions, mechanically enclosed but not alloyed, so it's not melded in. This is called half-breed copper. 
and the commercial miners, the miners are said to have cut these silver nodules off with knives and take them home. The presence of silver nodules in old copper culture tools shows they were made by hammering called cold working. These hammered weapons and tools found in Hopewell Mounds sometimes show specks of silver found only in the copper of Lake Superior. Now, this is references to it too, but apparently one instance of identification by silver inclusion has occurred overseas. In this letter of December 1st, 1995, Paulden Jenkins, a historian from Glastonbury, writes, I met a farmer who owns a land on which a megalithic stone circle is called Merry Maidens in far west Cornwall. There's that same place again. While clearing hedges, he discovered an arrowhead which was sent to the British Museum for identification. That identification answer returned. It's 5,000 year old and its source is Michigan, USA. Yeah, they can fingerprint it, and had they known, ooh, of it's conspicuous, they may not have said the same thing. Isn't that sad? The temperature of a wood fire is about 900 degrees max, but with charcoal it gets above 1,000 degrees, and forced air fires are even hotter, and met the need to obtain the 1,084 Celsius melting point of copper, the melting of crystallized copper and pouring it into oxide molds the shape of a skin of a flayed ox for shipping wherever it was done is the first step in its contamination. Remelting for pouring into tool molds can involve the use of fluxes, fuel contamination, the addition of used broken tools, and the addition of arsenic or even tin. Since metals always contain small portions of trace elements, it was thought um, we could follow the copper by looking at trace elements in copper elsewhere to see if it matched. The six early studies reported by Griffin all report native copper as 99.92% solid copper or pure. Rapp and others report that using trace element fingerprints using mostly Lake Superior copper samples probably geographic or geologic source identification can be done. The work of Hancock and others showed again that native copper, including Michigan copper, showed lower levels of tin, arsenic, and gold, and especially cobalt, than European-type coppers manufactured in their artifacts. British Museum reported generally low trace element content in all of their Egyptian artifacts. Years ago, the author collected some European copper and bronze axes, thinking that he might do some sampling of them for some commercially available trace element analysis. Unfortunately, the sample testing is only useful for hammered copper tools, not for real melted cast ones. <coughs> Looking at artifacts full of mixed contaminations or contaminants in their manufacturing, it is for the most part not been helpful. We need to look at the least disturbed samples, the ingot form in which copper was shipped, like those oxides that we just talked about. For it looks like what they would do with those oxides is remelt them, perhaps even making them into ingots of bronze, once the Bronze Age was kicking good, by adding tin into it that they get from Cornwall too. But some would have not been mixed, and it looks like on that Illiburan ship, it was a non-mixed form, and it had never been turned anything. It was raw, and again, it was coming from Egypt, and Nefertiti. The excellent 30-page 2002 study by Hatotman and others on the structure and composition of the ingots from 1300 BC, Ulibur and Wreck, that we talked about. The authors say the cargo represents the world market of bulk metal in the Mediterranean. The wreck contained 354 oxide-shaped ingots and 121 discoid or bun ingots altogether with 10 tons of copper at one time. Here's a depiction of the way it would have looked. And it looks, of course, very much like the Egyptians too, having a bit of a red ochre appearance to them. And the priest here, it looks light, but females would have been drawn light too. That's seen through all out the Mediterranean. So we can see that, but then here's one of those bun, here's one of the oxides that are shown here and here from an early museum shot 
this is a lineup of them in that ship that we're currently looking at and the Ulebrun. Here's one that has the trident symbol that's on it, famous of Neptune, who is supposed to be associated with Atlantis. Right? In this ancient land. So, wow, we can perhaps even infer something along that line. Here's the Egyptian people carrying stuff in here, and these aren't Egyptians here, and he's carrying in an ingot. Here he's carrying in a bunch of those little buns or whatever of them. Here's one of those ingots. Here's another one. And here's the counting person from Egypt. So it's got tons of copper in it, but then also in the middle ingot in the British Museum that's shown there, to the right, some of the ill brooding in ingots actually still on the seabed. But Taylor adds that three were found in Caligari, Sardinia, inscribed with a trident, a double axe, and an irregular P, which we talked about Cairo and how that works with the irregular P. The trident was a symbol for Poseidon, the god of the Atlanteans, who Plato says ran the metal trade in the ocean, named for them. The three supervised men are carrying oxides, baskets, and bun ingots on the tomb of Rechmeyer and Thebes. The bearded Phoenician man is carrying an ingot on the wall of the tomb of Hurat, also at Thebes. Left and right of this note, two ingots found in Egypt also. And I did a video on the tomb of Rechmeyer for not even this reason whatsoever, and I bet in those pictures there in the video that you'll probably see it. Additional ton of tin ingots were recovered in 120 ingots and fragments, a ratio of which roughly corresponds to the ratio of copper to tin in classical bronzes. So in other words, this could have been used to made up a hell of a lot of bronze weapons and so on. In fact, this may be the reason they didn't have weapons for a big old fight, like Troy or something like that. And it'd really screw them over, wouldn't it? Because they didn't get their giant tons of shipment that it would take to outfit an army. These ingots are all now in the Museum of Underwater Archaeology in Bodrum, Turkey, with the ingots also found in later date Cape Galadonia shipwreck. These were more ingots than the total of all found in the museums and private collections put together. Some oxide ingots have been excavated in the Minoan ruins of Hagia Trotia in Crete, dated to 1550 to 1500 BC, and others have been found in Sardinia, Cyprus, the Nile Delta, Turkey. Anatolia, if you will, even Bulgaria. Researcher Zena Halperin, I saw heaps of copper ingots in the Maritime Museum of Alpha Israel. Metal bars in the oxide shape dating from 1700 BC have been found at the foul mouth in Cornwall itself, England. Egyptian New Kingdom tomb paintings and tomb relief depict a number of copper ingots, but only one has been found in Egypt as they were consumed there. Hmm. So at that point, they'd be made into brass. For many years, the archaeological community has thought that lead isotope studies by an Oxford group, Gale and others, have proved that the ingots all came from Cyprus, like is what was said in the other first part. But in 1998, a Gale group reports performing approximately 1,000 lead isotope analysis of ores and ingots, including about 60 Ulebrun ingots. And they did not test a single sample of Michigan copper, though. The study reports that the Illibrian ingots are greater than 99.5% pure copper, and so don't fit it. In the Hopman study, the steel chisel was used to cut a piece of the surface sampling of 151 of the Illibrian ingots, and three oxides and one bun were drill cored all the way through. Their report states that the samples show porous volume of typical of blister copper that exceeds by far our previous ideals on their inner structure with void volume reaching 20% or higher, especially in the upper portions of the ingots. In general, cavities like these called sfretsin are caused by the effervescence of gases such as oxygen, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide from water in the burning charcoal. This is in contrast with copper from other periods and from other localities. And the ingots contain angular-shaped inclusions of iron silicate slags. Features compatible with nodal rocks affected by the impact of high temperatures in the solid state. These can be removed by repeated melting, but while these were regular steps, 
at many metal metallurgic sites all over the middle and south southern part of Africa even the yellow brewing ingots were not processed in this way the angular shape of the slag inclusions the structure of the existence of isochrite point to pouring of copper into a mold when the slag was already solidified interfaces of the crystalline structure of the ingots points to different batches during casting almost the samples contain cuprite distributed in changing amounts to the ingots associated with large voids the cuprite formed in corrosion in the sea does not penetrate for more than five millimeters or so in an oxygen rich atmosphere necessary to produce cuprite in a, in a good amount and therefore can eliminate the conclusion that ingots were consisted of as melted raw copper from a smelting furnace most of the ore available on Cyprus is of chalcopyritic composition and relics of sulfites that are quite difficult to completely remove yet this mixed sulfide does not occur in the copper ingots that we're talking about now the Hopman study concludes that from chemical point of view the purity of the ingots is an extraordinary comparison with other sorts of copper from Wadi Alabra which has high lead or the Caucasus area which had high arsenic or from Oman which has arsenic and nickel the ingots are made of pure copper and all the ingots show a homogeneous composition from metal for investigations we were able to conclude a conscious purification or even a refining process to produce the ingots we see few indications that bronze scrap would have been added due to the very low tin concentrations that are possible and it would not include glass bubbles and slag inclusions the ingots provide an explanation for the previously vexing question of how an ingot of metal as ductile as copper could have been broken up into small pieces such as those excavated by the hundreds of Sardinia too substantial degree in porosity and a high concentration of copper oxide inclusions which make it brittle simply dropping one of those big ingots on the ground on a hard surface could have made it shatter into pieces a 32 page study reviewed that the work to date says that all the oxide ingots are composed of essentially pure copper no meaningful con uh, conclusions on provenance can be currently drawn from consideration of trace elements of oxide of Cyprus or Sardinia it is no surprise that the only oxide ingot mold ever found Ras Al Ibn Syria in 1983 was surrounded by droplets bearing the same isotope signature as the vast majority of the oxide ingots they're talking about so a secondary smelting point the 1989 Gale report concludes that the Agia Tridia ingots in Crete are certainly not made of Cypriot copper like is reported and the copper sources could not be identified Dickinson author of the Aegean Bronze Age from the outside of the Aegean from outside of the Aegean came oxide ingots these have all when tested proved to be non Aegean metal so where did they go well enormous orders of bronze weapons are recorded on excavated in Bronze Age clay tablets for swords in the tens of thousands Roman soldiers are said to have worn up to 48 pounds of bronze in his uniform so here we go with a lot of things that are there chariots furniture vessels uh, drinking vessels everything all kinds of things were made out of this even rooms were lined with copper and bronze after the bronze Colossus of Rhodes was destroyed in an earthquake in 226 BC it was sold off to a merchant who almost used almost 1,000 camels to ship the pieces to Syria so that's what happened to it amazingly the Colossus of Rhodes contained a huge amount of copper and one wonders where all that came from in the first place too from only 5% of the Karum Kanesh tablets we already know that 110 donkey loads carrying 15 tons of tins in tin into Anatolia enough to produce 5 to 7 percent tin content 200 to 300 tons of bronze at one single time here's the prow of a nation Phoenician boat and here's this giant bronze part that would actually ram the other ones and how much did that take or the giant bronze statue behind it 
are the big bronze statues of Baal, 